Welcome into Sports Memos Betting Podcast. We're doing college football previews, ACC Coastal Division with Robbie Vino. Mr. Vino, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I am good today, Drew. How about yourself? I'm doing good, Robbie. You know, anytime we're talking college football, kind of brings a smile to my face. So uh, even though we're just previewing it and it's it's a look ahead, uh, we will be doing it from a Vegas perspective. You know, uh, saying the the against the spread numbers, but overall, it's it, it's getting ready for the season, helping betters out there, prospective betters, heck, even just college football fans see it better going into Week One. Uh, we're not too too far away. It is the end of May now. We're actually into June, pretty much. If you're listening to this, that is when we are breaking this down but uh robbie let's just start off at the top here we got the coastal division i'll just read it down uh we'll start off with duke first finished eight and five last year just three and five in conference had a tough time against acc opponents uh 382 points scored 356 given up went four and three at home four and two on the road played well away from uh away from home there if you bet on duke every game last year you went seven and six slightly made money there and seven and six over under as well small trender towards the over um when we're talking duke we're talking uh uh, in my opinion, one of the better coach teams in the country, Robbie, with uh, David Cutcliffe leading the way. They do lose Daniel Jones at the quarterback position. Surprised a lot of people in the NFL draft how high he went. I thought that the uh, Giants really reached for him, pretty much considering that, you, you know, the coaching pedigree he had in college with Cutcliffe, who, of course, uh, coached the Mannings back in the day, has had some other people make it to some other quarterbacks make it into the NFL. I think he's a great coach, especially for quarterbacks. But, um, heck, I, I, I'm not uh, 100% sure of their quarterback situation this u- upcoming year, Robbie, but I'm sure you'll tell us about it. And uh, what's your overall view of betting the blue, the Duke Blue Devils this season? Yeah, the quarterback situation, Drew, is going to fall in the hands of Quentin Harris, um, a guy who started a couple of games last year, played against Baylor, played against NC Central, put up pretty good numbers. Yeah, he was pretty good. Um, Cutcliffe seems to have the utmost faith in him. Just, you know, a quote from him. He was just stuck behind an exceptional quarterback last year. So um, <clears throat> they're going to go that route. Uh, he played in the spring, and uh, it's not much of a quarterback race at this point in time. It's Quentin Harris's job. On, you know, and not that Daniel Jones wasn't a mobile quarterback, Drew, because he was, but Harris can make even more plays with his legs. So that may be a somewhat bigger part of the offense this year, uh, d- considering the fact that, you know, Duke's a funny team. And, well, not funny, but they're kind of going on a zigzag pattern because what went wrong offensively in 2017, receivers couldn't catch, Daniel Jones was inaccurate. Offensive line couldn't block. All turned around last year. Receivers caught the ball. Daniel Jones was accurate. The offensive line protected, opened up some holes for the running game. Um, Now they're back maybe to 2017 where wide receivers, a real big question here. Not if you're talking to the head coach. The head coach loves his players, but they're inexperienced. Um, When you go through their roster, Drew, and who's going to be playing wide receiver this year, It's a tall group, a couple of six fours in there. And that's what Cutcliffe really likes about this young group of wide receivers. Um, He says their catch radius is really, really large, and he likes their hands. He likes the way they catch the football. He likes the way Quentin Harris throws the football. So the coach, and I guess that's who we should defer to, although, as I say quite often here on the podcast, when you come out of spring, everything is usually rainbows and roses. Um, But Cutcliffe's not really one to mix words. So I'd take his word for it that he sees a lot of upside in this passing game. I think it's their biggest concern for sure. Uh, Will they be able to protect enough? And will the receivers and quarterback hook up enough uh, this coming season? They're not in that difficult of a division, so maybe that helps a little bit. Uh, If you take a look at their schedule real quick, nobody in the Coastal plays a harder non-conference slate then does Duke who draws Alabama on a neutral in Atlanta Georgia to start the season and then later in November has to play Notre Dame very rarely do you see these power five teams have to play two major opponents in their four non-conference they usually take on one and then kind of layer the rest with people they can beat but uh for Duke that's two very very tough games cross to the other side of the division they don't get the 
cream of the crop, but still Wake Forest and Syracuse are tough opponents. So I think the schedule's, you know, tough enough for Duke this year, but they'll probably be in that upper echelon of this uh, coastal division trying to fight for the trying to fight for the championship. I don't know that they can get there. Like I say, I think a lot rides on the passing game because if Duke fails in that area and teams can load the box they're going to be in a lot of trouble. They got to straighten out their run defense too, which gave up over 200 yards last year per game. Yeah, Robbie. I mean, you, you, the opening game against Alabama, what that's in Atlanta, I believe it, that's kind of a head scratcher. Why? Why Duke would schedule that, right? Yeah, we rarely see um, these big time week zero or week one matchups. Um, you know, not non conference matchups that feature such a disparity point spread wise you know what I mean normally they put two teams together that are a a pretty competitive matchup but this one doesn't appear to be um, as competitive I don't know why Duke took it but maybe David Cutcliffe you know I was reading an article on how he loves the progress of the program and the fact that he's taken Duke um, in incremental steps up the ladder here and maybe this is just his way of trying to get them to the next level by playing more than one of those next level opponents outside of the conference um you know like like you were saying it it is kind of a head scratcher that they take on that game but i think after reading what i read about you know where he wants the direction of the program to go i think that's probably why i think he's ready to start seeing where they stand against these really really big time non-conference schools yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point, and, and there's no denying it. I mean, what Cutcliffe has done there at Duke, it, it's been pretty incredible. One of the better coaching kind of tenures here of, of the last decade or so. Um, you know, Duke was a, a bottom feeder year in, year out, and now they're making bowls almost every year, Robbie. So, um, you know, what he's doing, he needs to keep doing it, and, and they're, they're, they're knocking on the door of kind of taking that next step to be, uh, you know, top 25 each and every year. So they, they got the talent, they got the coaching, um, I mean, Alabama, week one, you know, Alabama's been going <laughs> against each other in practice for, uh, what, a month there before the season. They're going to – I think they're going to be up against it. But uh, outside of that game, I, I might look to bet them more times than not, the Duke Blue Devils. we got Georgia Tech up next, Robbie, and this is a, uh administration change. This is going to be a long year, in my opinion, for the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets there in Atlanta. They went 7-6 and six last year, did go 5-3 and three in conference, scored 437 points, only let up 380 when one went 4-3 and three at home, 3-3 three and three on the road, just 5-8 and eight against the spread. So uh, lost money if you were betting on the Yellow Jackets. Seven and five towards the over, trended slightly towards the over. Um, played well at Bobby Dodd there in Atlanta, but uh, they're not going to be running the option anymore, from what I've read. And uh, th- th- this could be a, a, a longer year here, Robbie, for the for the Yellow Jackets. Yeah, on both sides of the football here, Drew. You know, I think when we talked about the SEC, <clears throat> I had mentioned uh, offensive overhauls that were 360 degree polar opposites at Arkansas and I think we talked about Florida State as well but just to reiterate last year when Chad Morris came in to take over for Brett Bielema there couldn't be a bigger difference in offensive philosophies and when Willie Taggart came in for Jimbo Fisher huge difference in offensive philosophies and both of those teams floundered on that side of the football last year and this is even a more dramatic change you're going to bring um or you're going to get rid of the triple option and a core group of kids that were recruited to play triple option football. Here comes Jeff Collins, returns home to Georgia Tech, dream job of his. Um, very glad to be there. He was successful at Temple in the um, <clears throat> last couple of years. He had, first year he had to weed, weed out a lot of uh, players who weren't used to at that point, they weren't used to SEC type of off seasons. Uh, that's no knock against Matt Rule, the uh, the head coach who left Temple prior to Jeff Collins arriving. But a lot of those kids, and I had firsthand knowledge of this, just uh, weren't used to SEC regimens in the off season. So he's bringing it here to Georgia Tech. <clears throat> They're going to run a fast tempo, pro style offense. I mean, it's You know, it's probably going to be somewhat morphed, Drew, um, so to speak, like they'll ease into this thing. 
but their quarterbacking situation is really not good at this point in time. Uh, Tobias Oliver is the returning quarterback. He's an option style guy who they use that nickel corner in the spring. So that shows you um, exactly what he's going to be doing um, this this upcoming season. Now, there may be packages designed for Tobias Oliver uh, to run the football or to run some type of option plays, but they're really looking at a sophomore, Lucas Johnson, who's the better passer. Um, he would have been the number two quarterback last year, but he got hurt. So he looks like the guy that's going to start here for Georgia Tech. So many things changed, Drew. I mean, the, the blocking scheme changes, so the offensive linemen have to learn all new blocking techniques. You know, that option style is a ton of cut blocking, which is totally different. Remember, Georgia Tech is a team that basically plays with one six foot five wide receiver for the last 10 years. Uh, now they've got a fleet of wide receivers out there, guys that have to learn hey, we're going to run some patterns and we're going to catch a ball now. You know, it's just not Georgia Tech football. So you have to, um, you know, consider the fact that there's going to be a lot of mistakes, especially early on. I know once again, coming out of spring, offensive coordinator Dave Pattonard was, you know, upbeat about his team. But, you know, this is a huge overhaul. I'm not so sure that it's going to go well not only in the beginning of the season, but all the way through for Georgia Tech. We'll see what they look like come opening day, but it's not going to look anything like Georgia Tech football. It's a tough, tough system change. And on the defensive side, they're going to go more to a multiple style defense now. Andrew Thacker comes in. Uh, he was the Temple defensive coordinator and linebacker coach. So they, you know, they played a different style of defense at Temple too. So again, 4-3 system in 2017. Nate Woody comes in and runs a 3-4 that he brought from Appalachian State last year. And in comes the new defensive coordinator who runs multiple fronts consistently. So a lot of learning to go on on both sides of the football for this team. Can't expect much out of them. Obviously, in my uh, preseason power ratings after doing my work on Georgia Tech, I had to drop them some. Outside of the uh, conference, their non-conference games, they're going to get South Carolina week two. You know, for South Carolina, that's a good pull to get Georgia Tech that early before they know what the heck they're doing. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the year, they get Georgia. So two non-conference games they'll probably lose. When you cross over to the other side, to the Atlantic side, they have to face Clemson which is no fun whatsoever, and they'll have to face NC State. The point spread's the great equalizer, Drew. We know that, but uh, we'll see where odds makers line these guys. But very, very difficult for me to see Georgia Tech doing a lot of good things, especially first, third, first half of the season. Yeah, Rob, a couple of things here on Georgia Tech. One, you know, the program, they, they won the national championship, I believe, in like 1990 or something. So the, the program's, you know, kind of fallen off since uh, – the, the glory days, so to speak. But I'll tell you, Georgia Tech, right there in Atlanta, you know, a fertile, fertile recruiting ground. Um, they got a pretty good setup, too. The Bobby Dodd Stadium on campus. I used to live in Atlanta and go to, you know, a, a Thursday night game. They always had a, there's always a Thursday night game for Georgia Tech throughout the season and would hit that it was great atmosphere man so so they should be able to recruit well if he gets it going here gets that ball rolling georgia tech in the next two three four years could be a uh, a pr pretty good program um but you know a lot has to go right there i i would say this robbie you bring up the fact that they are going to go a little bit more up tempo they're going to be up against it you know talent wise especially in some of these games early like you said the south carolina game the georgia game some of these acc games um, and you know what that means. Going up tempo, not having the defense, you know, be really strong, the offense not getting first downs. All of a sudden, these point spreads, the, the odds makers kind of can't make them high enough. Do you think that could be a situation this year with Georgia Tech maybe look to fade them here the first month? Yeah, I mean, just look at the first two games. Not only did they play South Carolina, but week one is Clemson. Oh, now, against yeah. Clemson, they could get destroyed, which – if you take the other side and look the other way at this, Drew, you might say that getting murdered by Clemson in week one, if that should happen, but it's likely to happen, and then getting beat by South Carolina in week two would lead to maybe a little extra value on Georgia Tech. Nobody's going to want to bet this team at that point. Coming into the season, nobody's going to want to bet them. 
So if you get beat twice and don't cover spreads, less people are going to want to bet him. Probably leads to more value. Jeff Collins goes up against his ex-team Temple in their fourth game, which comes off a bye week. They'll probably be prepared for that. <clears throat> He's going to know the Temple personnel real well. Maybe at that point, points are worth looking at and, and with Georgia Tech. But um, I think if you're looking to that situation, your hope is that Clemson wins by six touchdowns <clears throat> and then South Carolina wins by like four so that you get the ultimate value um, or as much as you can get the maximum value with Georgia Tech by the time they play Temple. Yeah, Robbie, I'll tell you, that, that week one versus Clemson, that is a tough, tough handicap there for the odds makers. Putting out a number on that one is very tricky. I can tell you this, they're not looking forward to taking big bets on that. It's just a tough thing for odds makers to do with a new system coming into Georgia Tech. They're up against it talent-wise, going up against arguably the most powerful team in the country. It is going to be a, 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 a tough one for them to put out a number. I mean, I you could see it. Well, at what point would you look to bet Georgia Tech, Robbie? If I told you it was Clemson minus thirty-five, what what would you look to bet? Yeah, I think you'd still have to bet Clemson at that point because chances are <clears throat> it could be um, forty-two to three at halftime or something. Now, it, chances are real good that Dabo takes his foot off the gas in the fourth quarter. Um, but do you think? that a team in a brand new offense is going to rally and backdoor in the fourth quarter against Clemson's second string defense you know that's probably doubtful um, so I think you'd have to take Clemson at that price I don't I don't know if that was one of the 100 games that was released yesterday Drew um, but you're right I mean it's going to be a very difficult number to make for odds makers they probably can't make it high enough yeah, that, that's a tricky one there. We'll move down the line here, guys. And we're talking with Robbie Vino at Rob Vino Sports on Twitter. I am Drew Martin at Drew Martin Bets on Twitter. Guys, if you're liking these podcasts, please reach out to us on Twitter. Um, feel free to ask any questions, college football, betting, whatever you want to hear, what conference you want us to talk next. We can talk uh, any of them, the big boys, the uh, the, the non-power five. You want to talk some Sunbelt next, uh, reach out and let us know at Rob Vino Sports or myself at Drew Martin Bets bets on twitter and uh coupon code cfb podcast that's cfb podcast at checkout on sportsmemo.com for 200 dollars off robbie vino's college football nfl full season package or just college football package either one for the full season you can take 200 dollars off of robbie vino or myself drew barton's college football full season cfb podcast at checkout rob let's move on down the line here we got the miami hurricanes another change in administration here we got uh, manny diaz taking over the defensive coach getting the head coaching position they went seven and six last year four and four in acc play scored 375 four points let up only 253 that defense was solid last year for the canes went five and one at home in hard rock stadium in south florida went two and five on the road this canes team had a real tough time in road games five and eight ats did not fare well against the number and five and seven towards the under in terms of totals they trended towards the under a defensive team last year had some trouble at the quarterback position kind of shifting in and out young athletic quarterback looks to to, to be the case this year but uh manny diaz and company coming in how you looking to bet the canes this year robbie yeah you know their last seven games last year were all unders drew so uh a lot of that attributed to the defense as you mentioned from miami and a lot of it attributed to some of the flaws that they had on the offensive side of the football they only allowed better than 28 points twice all season long and they were you know the bookend games the very first game against lsu give up 33 very last game the bowl game against wisconsin give up 35 um in a game where they were favored and absolutely blown off the field by Wisconsin in that contest. So coming in, um, it probably a little bit of determination on Miami's part. The Manny Diaz situation is funny. You know, he had taken the Temple head coaching job, left Miami, went to Temple. All of a sudden, Mark Rick unexpectedly steps down, and here comes Manny Diaz flying back to take the head coaching job. It's a good thing for the Canes because Diaz and his turnover chain – um, you know, uh, knows that defense inside and out. So it's a good situation to have where you're not going to have any disruption on the defensive side of the football here for this team. 
and that's their strength. So that's a good thing for Miami having Diaz come back as head coach. Now, not being the defensive coordinator, but certainly it's his defense that was implemented and is going to stay in place. He had to go out and find himself a defensive coordinator, and he went out and got somebody he was very familiar with, Blake Barker, Louisiana Tech defensive coordinator the last three years. These two guys work together at Louisiana Tech, at Texas. Barker believes in everything that Diaz believes in philosophically on the defensive side. I mean, he worked under him uh, at both of those universities, Louisiana Tech and Texas, so it stands to reason they're both on the same wavelength here. Defense should be solid. There's enough personnel there to be good once again. The offensive side is going to be your question mark, and I'll tell you, Drew, I don't know that I could like two offensive coordinator hirings inside one division more than I love two of them that are in this conference a couple of my favorite OCs in college football for years one being Dan Enos who is the hire here at Miami and for me Dan Enos um, his play calling to me it really really good that's what I like about him the most he's adaptable to any situation he's got his hands full at quarterback here you know they lose Malik Rozier Coming back, Nikosi Perry started, I think, half the games last year, right? It was like one week it would be Perry, one week it's Rozier, who knows? They get Tate Martell, five-star prospect that went to Ohio State to transfer and come to Miami. And then they have another redshirt freshman, Jaron Williams, who was a four-star recruit, didn't play much last year. Those three guys went to the spring game or spring practices. They battle it out. Out of the whole mix, it looks like it's Jaron Williams. Dan Enos and the coaching staff, Nothing but praise for Williams, a dual threat type quarterback, the best passing arm of the three, the most accurate, according to the coaching staff of the three. And Jaron Williams, who was about to transfer out of Miami, probably winds up as your starting quarterback here this year. He looked the best in the spring game. And like I say, the coaching staff is behind him right now. So it looks like that's the way they're going to go there. Should be able to run the football, should be able to throw the football. I think the biggest question mark on this team right now is going to be that offensive line. You know, Mark Richt, um, a pro-style type of uh, coach, very, I don't know, he's not as prehistoric as some, but Mark Richt was very, very much a traditional offensive coordinator and couldn't really get the offensive line right during his short stay there. And there's only one full-time starter back this year. So Miami's going to have to fill some holes on the line. That would probably be their biggest concern. But I'll say this. um, Dan Enos, who's going to come in and run a spread offense, and he's kind of a disciple of the West Coast. They're going to call this the spread coast is what they're calling their offense this year. Um, He utilizes everybody. And look what he did at Arkansas. He turned Austin Allen and his brother, the two Allen brothers, I think, into pretty decent well one of them's in the NFL right now just off of the philosophy that Brett Bielema runs the football so we'll throw play action passes with you guys and I think one of those Allen kids completed 70% of his passes one year or close to it so I think he's a really really good hire here Miami should be more explosive on the offensive side of the football if they can find their quarterback it looks to me You know, we're still heading into summer practice this is really really early and they're only practicing against themselves but off of the coach's comments, it looks like um, they found their man at quarterback here in Jaron Williams. Robbie, good breakdown of the Miami Hurricanes. And looking at uh, what week one here, we got Miami versus Florida. It's actually week zero. This is a standalone game. This is a this is a big time opportunity for these Canes and the Gators on the other side. We're seeing the Gators minus seven and a half neutral site game um, in in Orlando. What do you think in week one? Um, if you had to make a bet right now, Florida minus seven and a half versus Miami. Yeah, you know, I'd have to give Dan Mullen the advantage. I think he's got his program <clears throat> off of last year and into this year springboarded in the right direction. Um, so I think this early in the year, while Miami adjusts a little bit on their offensive side, still looking, you know, not having a guy with, if it, if it is Williams, not having a guy with any returning experience at quarterback that early against that type of defense could be tough. I'd probably look towards Florida. The line's in a good place, but I think that Florida at that particular time of year is probably the right way to go. 
Yeah, I agree with you. If you made me bet it, I, I would probably lean towards Florida. Although Miami's defense, um, especially that the, the mm-hmm. defensive line, I, I think could be pretty good. And you bring up the fact that um, what Blake Baker comes over from Louisiana Tech, uh, that Louisiana Tech defense was really good, Robbie. So I, I, I would... I would think that Miami's defense is going to be really good. Actually, it might look towards the under there, Miami versus Florida week one. What what do you think about that? Yeah, that could be too, depending upon where they set it. I know Mullen got Florida out of that, somewhat out of that offensive rut. They still weren't very thrilling offensively, but they weren't as horrible as they were the year before. Second year in the system, maybe a little better, but this is a tough defense. And as we mentioned earlier, you know, it's Diaz's defense. And nothing's going to change there. They've been good for two years. We just went over the numbers and the reason why their games go under. They closed the season last year on seven straight unders. That figures to continue here for Miami until they get that offense going. All right, Robbie, we'll move down the back half of this uh, Coastal Division quickly. We got UNC up next. Terrible year for the Tar Heels, just 2-9, and 1-7 in and and conference, 0-6 um, on the road. They did go 5-5 five and five ATS, so you didn't lose a ton of money if you bet them week in, week out. 7-3 and three trended towards the over. What are you thinking here for UNC this year? Well, another complete coaching staff overhaul, Mac Brown. Back oh, yeah. College football, right? So, Mac Brown went out, and I'll tell you, he did a great job hiring as far as coordinators go. He goes out and he gets Phil Longo from Ole Miss, and he's turned the offense over to them. North Carolina is going to become an air raid football team under uh, Phil Longo. They want to go fast, faster, fastest. Mac Brown's quote during the spring was that he wants his offense to look like Oklahoma. Wants a dynamic physical rushing attack combined with an explosive downfield or vertical passing game. Wants to run plays as fast as Lincoln Riley's offense. So here you go. Um, You know, the cupboard's open for Phil Longo to go ahead and get this set up. Now, whether or not they have the capabilities to do that in year one remains to be seen. And you talked earlier. um, I forget who we were talking about right off the bat. Maybe Georgia Tech. But here's an instance, Drew, where you go to air raid and if you have a bunch of three and outs and a defense where Mac Brown was quoted as saying he's very, very concerned with the how thin they are at defensive line and linebacker. The front seven has zero depth. They've got to bring a lot of young kids in. True freshmen, redshirt freshmen, guys with no experience. They're going to be on the field. And if you have a bunch of three and outs because you're running an air raid and you can't quite do it the right way yet could be troublesome for that defense so north carolina again like georgia tech going to work through some kinks here with their new overhaul uh on the offensive side but i think in the long run it's a real good um deal for north carolina because i think they can recruit that type of talent there remember last year drew here's another situation at quarterback last year we're watching Chaz surratt and nathan elliott game in and game out and I can tell you that I for one was banging my head against the wall quite a few times with those guys in the game um, missing passes when North Carolina had a pretty good offense last year but the quarterbacks blew a lot of situations for that team this year it's a three man wide open competition Cade Fortin is one guy that we saw play last year number six I kind of remember these guys by number more than name Um, But Fortin was a guy who was in a couple of games last year and looked like the best of the three. He's got a chance to be the starter this year. But right now it looks like uh, true freshman Sam Howell might have the leg up. No decision made. We don't know who the quarterback's going to be. Mac Brown likes the fact that he's got a lot of poise and a quick release. So we'll see who the quarterback ends up being. But that offense, while I like the hire of Longo, while I like the direction they're going, it could bring some problems to this team. If they don't execute <clears throat> right out of the chute, defensively, they hire Army's Jay Bateman as their defensive coordinator. And, you know, it couldn't be more different for him, right? He comes from Army where they run option and they milk clock and his defense gets rest. And now he comes to a place where they're going to run air raid and his defense may not get any rest. He runs a 3-4 multiple. <clears throat> They'll change defensive fronts like crazy, he said. And in fact, in their spring game, the first 10 plays of the game, Army ran six different defensive fronts. Um, in, in name only, they're a base 3-4. 
but uh, Jay Bateman made it perfectly clear that their whole deal here is just to game plan to opponent's strength and opponent's scheme, and they'll run whatever defense is necessary. His primary, and they've got a whole special, I was reading, they have a whole special segment of their practice, um, which is dedicated solely to shedding tackles and then tackling. He teaches form tackling, rugby style tackling, one of the few coaches. He said that when he was at Army, when they got rid of the idea of head hunting and started to teach rugby style tackling, um, really wrapping up at the waist, Army all of a sudden only had one head injury for an entire year, and they're trying to, you know, minimize the head injuries for this team because they're so thin. Probably all good stuff in practice, um, all good stuff in theory, and I think Jay Bateman's a good hire too. It's just a matter of how quickly North Carolina can acclimate to all of these changes and the fact that they're just so thin in that defensive front seven. Gosh, talk about where you don't want to be thin in today's college football defensive line and linebacker, and that's uh, what you're pointing out, Robbie. So uh, that is definitely something to watch there for North Carolina. Moving down the list, we got Pittsburgh up next, seven and seven last year, six and three in conference. Um, let's see, eight and six ATS and five and nine trended towards the under here. We're talking uh, the Pittsburgh Panthers. What are you thinking this year for? I believe the ACC Coastal Champion last year, Robbie. Yeah, well, here's my other guy. I mean, I go back to Miami of Florida when he was the offensive coordinator there. But Mark Whipple has really been one of my favorites <coughs> at the offensive coordinator spot um, for a lot of years. Now, he comes over from Massachusetts. He was the head coach. We all know what Massachusetts offense did. He's a pass first type of um, offensive coordinator. There's no doubt about it. His top wide receiver, Andy Isabella, last year winds up. I think he went third round in the draft um so he can get receivers tight ends whatever to catch the football he can direct the passing game and again like i said about enos except even <clears throat> i would put him a notch above dan enos as far as play calling is concerned i love the way mark whipple calls a game uh even his own defense this early in the spring uh, commented on the fact that this guy keeps us off balance on every play we don't know where they're going with the football Pittsburgh is a team that was so stagnant offensively last year. Basically a run, a heavy, heavy, heavy run-oriented offense. And the receivers really never expected to catch the football. You read some receiver quotes since Mark Whipple took over and they went through spring practices and their spring game. And they're in love with this guy. Um, A couple of guys went so far as to knock. Sean Watson a little bit, the previous offensive coordinator, for not sitting down with them and trying to figure out their strengths and showing the the, the core, the the routes that he wanted them to run. Totally different with Whipple. He's going to attack all three levels of the football field. He's going to do a great job play calling. The problem for him is going to be is he doesn't have the ground game or he likely won't have the ground game that they had last year. They lose two 1,000-yard rushers. They lose four offensive linemen. <clears throat> it's going to be difficult. Um, so they may be a better pass team this year than run. Although Pat Narduzzi, you know, he comes from Wisconsin and um, or Michigan State, excuse me. And Pat Narduzzi's always been a run-first head coach. He said, we're still going to run. Don't think we're air whipple. We're going to run. So I'd look for more of a balanced offense than last year. Um, obviously, like I've said uh, during this analysis, I like the way he calls the game. I like the way he throws to all receivers on the field. Doesn't matter. Even the tight ends are excited about being in this offense. Defensively, <clears throat> they're going to be pretty good. I'd expect them to be even a little bit better. This is the team that won the Coastal last year. I don't know that they can repeat, but if Kenny Pickett, the quarterback, and that receiving crew, if they get a passing game down and Maybe you never know with offensive lines, Drew. It's one of the hardest things to handicap is how these guys are going to mesh. It's easy to say, oh, they lost four starters. They're not going to be any good. But you just don't know when a group comes in and they mesh together. The offensive line works as a unit probably more than any other um, position group on the field. So if for now I'll say they're going to be down with the running game and with the offensive line. But who knows? Uh with the excitement that's built up around that program right now, they could be pretty good. 
Robbie, let's. Uh, we got two teams left. They're both um, in the state of Virginia. Virginia is for lovers, I believe, is the saying. But uh, either way, Virginia Cavaliers up first, eight and five overall, three hundred and seventy points scored four, only two hundred and sixty-one given up. Very good defense here. The uh, what third best defense in terms of points given up in the ACC, only behind Clemson and Miami. Um, Virginia went 9-4 and four ATS. Uh, they were really good out of the gate. Uh, mobile quarterback, good defense. What Bronco Mendenhall has been able to do there in Charlottesville has been impressive. 7-6 and six towards the over. What are you thinking here for the Cavaliers, the Wahoos this year, Robbie? Yeah, boy, the last two teams we'll talk about, Drew, they show some stability in the coaching staffs. So we don't have to worry about system overhauls with either of these two teams. I think Virginia could win this division this year potentially <clears throat> just from a straight up perspective maybe they could be the best team um and bronco mendenhall let us know real early when he got to virginia that he was going to take a methodical approach to building this program and boy has he but slowly but surely he's put all the pieces in place um can i tell you that i love another offensive coordinator in this division it's crazy but robert and i is a guy who worked under Rich Rodriguez and under Mike Leach. He's an air raid coordinator, a run-oriented spread coordinator. He's so adaptable that Virginia was able to change their offensive system three times in the first three years until they got to last season when they decided to use more of the Rich Rodriguez scheme because they had the dual-threat quarterback in Perkins, and it worked. Um, Perkins may be the top quarterback in this division for sure. Uh, It'll be between him and Ryan Willis of Virginia Tech. Willis the better passer or more of a pocket passer. But I got, you know, you got to like this team. Um, Everything that they have going for them on the defensive side of the football that Mendenhall's built, the stability in the coaching staff, the offensive progress that they've made. And they're a little bit worried about their wide receivers, but they do have talent coming back. So I think when you have a quarterback of this caliber, and you got enough offensive line, which it seems like they do. I can't find as many holes in the Virginia team as I can in the other six in this particular division. So I would lean towards them as your preseason favorite to win it. Um, The schedule is not overly difficult for this team. We talked earlier about Duke playing a really hard non-conference schedule, but, you know, Virginia plays Notre Dame. They'll go to South Bend. But other than that, it's Old Dominion. It's William and Mary, and it's Liberty. So, you know, three and one uh, in non-conference, and when they cross over, they'll get a home game against Florida State, where I think they could be very, very competitive, and they get Louisville. Uh, Even though it's on the road, we know Louisville is going to be down this year once again. So got to like Virginia from a straight-up perspective right now. We'll see if they get a lot of attention um, from the odds makers as far as power rating and lines are concerned. If they don't, I think Virginia will be a pretty good play, and I think they'll be more explosive this year offensively as well. And they've gotten step by step better on that side of the football. Robbie, great breakdown so far. We got one team left, and guys, <laughs> remember the coupon code at checkout CFB podcast for Robbie Vino or myself, Drew Martin's full season college football or NFL and college football betting service. Uh, it, it, it's a great thing there to um, – Robbie's been good in college football of late, and uh, so have I. So if, if you're looking for a betting service, check out sportsmemo.com in the coupon code CFB podcast at checkout. We got last team up. We'll head from Charlottesville to Blacksburg. Robbie, Virginia Tech, 6-7 and seven last year, 4-4 four and four in the ACC um, went three and five in Lane Stadium. Uh, not too much of a of a home field uh, domination there last year in Blacksburg. Three and two on the road. Six and seven ATS. So lost some money for their backers and uh, an over trender. Eight and four towards the over there for the Hokies. How are you looking to bet VT this year, Robbie? Yeah, I think that's the way Justin Fuente, the head coach, would like it from an offensive perspective. And it may be the way they go this year, Drew, because they have the best passing attack in this division, bar none. Ryan Willis has a fleet of receivers where they may turn into a, um, you know, 60-40, maybe a little heavier pass-style team. Although, they closed last season. If you look at the rushing yardage and the passing yardage that they gained in their last four games, they became very, very balanced. Problem for Virginia Tech this year could be their offensive line, which again loses three starters. Um, They've got some kids, though, that 
are sophomores, turning sophomores. They were freshmen last year that got game experience. Didn't start, but got experience. And they're going to be plugged into that offensive line along with a transfer from Coastal Carolina. So maybe the OL, not as um, decimated as it might look just on paper where returning starters are concerned. The other side of that coin, let's look at Bud Foster's defense, which just didn't even look like a Bud Foster defense last year. I mean, they give up 439 yards per game. They set some records for through uh, Bud Foster. I think it's a 24 or yeah, 24th season that he's been at Virginia Tech, and never were they as bad as they were last year. But he's got 11 guys back on that side of the ball. Now, did the guys stink? Or is the experience going to help them? They suffered through injuries upon injuries last year and inexperience. I remember um, betting these games, or quite a few of their games, over the total because of the fact that the secondary was depleted. And I think that, you know, Bud Foster's got a track record, Drew. He builds good defenses. So getting 11 starters back, having the team healthy again, I think the defense comes back. They can throw the football. We'll see if they can run it as well. If they do, you know, it's between them and Virginia, in my estimation. Or, yeah, to win this division, Miami right in there as well. I think you would make those your top three. Miami's quarterback play a far bigger question than the other two. But uh, <clears throat> Virginia Tech, which was down last year, could be back this year and back in a pretty big way in this division. Robbie, great breakdown of the ACC Coastal Division. Guys, we'll have Robbie on next week to uh, break down the next conference, next division. Uh, hit us up on Twitter at Drew Martin Betts or at Rob Vino Sports, and uh, we'll answer any questions you want. College football betting, college football uh, fan questions, what conference, uh, heck, lifestyle questions, whatever you want to shoot at us <laughs> is cool on Twitter at Rob Vino Sports or at Drew Martin Betts. Guys, thanks for tuning in. We'll talk next week. Have a fun, safe weekend. <laughs>